watching Yana TV. And today we have an incredible guest, Yasmin Abdel Madrid, who just delivered her incredible speech of Women of Wealth and Abundance Conference. And Yasmin is an engineer, an author, and humanitarian. So Yasmin, great to have you with us here today. Thanks, Yana. I'm really excited. Yeah. I learned a lot about you now during your speech and your presentation. So it was actually quite incredible that you were an engineer. Yeah, it's um people look at me and usually are like, uh, are you sure? Yes. Because, <laughs> There's a little bit of a disconnect, yeah. you know? <laughs> They're not quite sure. They, I mean, the image they have of an engineer in their mind is not quite me. But I kind of like that. I like challenging people's ideas of what an engineer is. I mean, you ask, I don't know what it's like here, but you ask in... You know, where I grew up, if you asked a group of students what an engineer actually does, most people couldn't actually tell you because most people have no concept of what engineering actually is. But it's also a very male profession, oh, right? Yes. Yep, so yep, it's yep. very interesting that being such a unique woman as you are, you have chosen something rather traditional and male-dominated. So yeah. how is this experience? So I'll tell you how I got into <laughs> yes, engineering, <please. laughs> actually. It's a funny story. My dad's an engineer, but that wasn't what got me into it. Mm -hmm. I watched this movie when I was 13 years old called Catch That Kid. Terrible movie. It was like the Italian job for kids. But there was one of the boys was driving a go-kart around a track. And I was like, that sound, that looks like so much fun. I want to be the first female black Muslim Formula One driver. That is my goal in life. Yes. And my mom was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it like, I fell in love with the world of motorsport. I... I started reading about cars and wanting to design cars. I ended up doing design and technology and graphics at school. And I wanted to do engineering for two reasons. One, so I could make fast cars. But two, because I think engineering for me is a tangible way to fix problems and potentially a tangible way for me to fix problems in society. So I felt like there was a, you know, a humanitarian element mm. to it as well as a adrenaline rush as well. Mm. But I did mechanical engineering. There were seven girls and 300 guys in my class. That's quite interesting combination for studying. Yeah. A lot of boyfriends. <laughs> a lot of choice. Yes. A lot of choice, yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, I was the first female my company hired in my department in Australia as a field engineer. And, you know, they, they weren't quite sure how to handle me. One of the first things I got asked was, can you lift a spanner? Like, do you, are you strong enough? And the guy who asked me was literally half my size. I was like, I can lift you, man. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. But it was, it was quite funny. Like, I went in and I just thought about it like an adventure. Mm -hmm. I imagined my life like it was a movie. And I was like, you know what? If, there was, if this was a movie, there will be all sorts of things that go wrong, but ultimately I will prevail. Inshallah. Well, usually when you when you like a, a hero, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go on <laughs> a hero journey and then eventually you win. Exactly. So. So that's, that's what I told myself. Whenever stuff didn't go my way or didn't go right, I'd be like, this is just part of the journey. Mm. Indeed. So, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so now, I mean, I know you spent interesting and quite a few, a lot of time now in engineering. Is there any like interesting stories or when you just started, what was the reaction of guys, you know, again, yeah. how, how did they get to accept your presence and maybe adjust their style? It's really interesting because, you know, I've got quite a few things going for me. I'm brown skinned. Yes, clearly. I'm a Muslim. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a woman. So for a lot of the white guys that are on my rig uh, in Australia, I was an unusual creature. And like, you'd sort of have guys be like, ooh, can we talk to you? Like, will you burst into tears? Like, you know, I mean, and it's, it's not that bad all the time, but I mean, often it's like the guys don't quite know how to treat you. And this is, this was in 2012. I got hired for my first job in 2012, early 2012. So it's not that long ago. Yeah. The industry is changing. The industry is changing. And what I like to tell people is that we've got legislative change. Like you've got the laws that back you up and say women have equal right mm -hmm. to be in this community. But you don't have social change. And so what, was, what we see is that on the rigs, the attitudes towards women are like a hyper-masculine version of the attitudes towards women on land or, mm. you know, on shore or not on the rig. Essentially what it's doing is reflecting, you know, a deep-rooted um, deep patriarchy or a deep-rooted gender inequality. Can you give an example? Well, like maybe a communication example. Yeah, okay. Um, let me think. So... Say, for example, the, thi uh, 
say, for example, a female supervisor. Mm -hmm. a, the difficulty that people may have taking instructions from a female supervisor, particularly from a younger female supervisor, is not necessarily a, a reflection on that person, but a reflection on the fact that, A, they're not used to it because the women in their life have never been people that have given them instruction and they're used to male voices of authority. Mm -hmm. B, it may you know, be linked to the fact that, you know, in their home life, they're the they're the boss or they're the authority and and all around them all the leaders they see are, are male mm -hmm. so how can they reconcile having a female in that role of leadership and the age thing is an is a whole other factor yes but and i think particularly in asia people can relate to that yeah. you know that like here it's it's a huge factor so when you're much younger it's not easy to yeah. influence or lead people who are older so the question is how do you then lead people you know if you're in a position if you've been given a position of leadership over people that are sometimes triple my age when i started in the industry i was working with people that were triple my age good how for do, you girl <laughs> how, do I, how do i get someone triple my age to listen to my instructions? so what did you do what is the tip it's about two things one is gaining legitimacy, and two is that human connection and respect. So gaining legitimacy means that you have to know your stuff through and through, right? You have to earn your place. You already are starting at a lower place, right? Because they've already got preconceived notions mm -hmm. of who you are. So you have to work your way back up. You have, to, you have to show that you're technically competent. You have to kind of have a couple of wins, right? Um, whether it's having a discussion where, you know, you're talking about something technical and you, the solution you offer is the right one. Or, you know, in a conversation you talk, you, you, you say one or two things that prove that you know what you're talking about. Mm. Could or, it be that you have to work harder as a woman? Oh, definitely. Absolutely, right? Definitely. Okay, you so basically have you have hard. to prove your place under the sun. Yeah, and, and there's no doubting that women have to work so much harder to, to be acknowledged. Yeah. yeah, and in fact... One of my favorite quotes is that women have yet earned the right to be mediocre. <laughs> Which means to me that when we have as many incompetent women in power as we have incompetent men, we've reached true equality. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right? That's because, a great one. Because right now, any woman that reaches, that reaches a position of power and influence is on point. You know, women that reach the top have worked so hard and broken so many barriers. So they are so much more resilient and capable and strong. You see, it's interesting. So basically what you're talking about is when you are coming from some kind of suppressed or not as recognized background or social layer, mm. then in order to become really kind of successful, you have to become very, very good. Oh, so it yeah. trains you on all levels mm. to be very professional and to really know what you're doing. And you end up being a better operator. You, you end up being a better operator. <laughs> yeah. you, end up being, you end up being better. I mean, and, and so what then you have to do is open the doors for others. Yes, so, so that's the next question, hard. right? Yeah. So now I know that there are many other women who are following your footsteps or maybe they're laying their own path to success and they're trying to succeed in the male-dominated industry, right? So what I think is great, right? Yeah, we want girls awesome. to do this. Yeah, yeah. So at the same time, in your opinion and based on your experience, what would be the best way for them mm. to present themselves as women? Because what we don't want to have we don't want women to be so intimidated by guys and trying to compete with mm -hmm. men so much mm -hmm. that they want to become like men, yes. right? We want women to stay women, to keep all wonderful female qualities and just grow into this inner power that you, you can facilitate the change. So what would be your mm -hmm. advice on that? What shall they do and how they should do it? Mm -mm -mm. Another great question, Maya. <laughs> I think it is so important. It's taken me a long time to learn. Yes. I remember when I first started in the rigs, my mom gave me a stern talking to. She's like, Yasmina, you're not a man. Stop trying to be a man. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, mom, just because I go to the gym all the time and I wear like masculine clothing does not mean I want to. But the point was, and I used to get very frustrated when the guys on the rig would refer to the fact that I was a woman. Mm. The reality is, as one of my friends said to me, you are a woman. Why are you so afraid of that? And what we have to do is we have to realize that all around us, we have seen examples of male leadership. Mm -hmm. right and masculine qualities of leadership but that does not mean it's the only type of leadership and we don't have to feel like we need to replicate what men do in order to be successful mm -hmm. so do what you do whatever whatever it is that you do do it well mm -hmm. 
there's the research shows there are two ways that women tend to externally project themselves. One is through proving themselves, which we talked about earlier, which is this concept of working incredibly hard so no one can possibly deny how good you are. And the second is projecting a really professional image so you don't actually get to get you don't actually get to know someone personally. It's just super super professional. What I tend to do is I will try to find a balance. You know, I will work pretty hard, but at the end of the day I'm not going to kill myself for for a cause or kill myself, you know, in order to prove myself to a random group of people. I'm going to take care of myself as well. And so I think that self-care bit is really important. We have to ensure that yes, if we're going to prove ourselves, we do it, but we also take care of ourselves. And the pro the professional image is important, but don't be afraid of human connection. Because that was the second the second hint I have or the second tip I have when you're dealing with people that may not necessarily be listening to you or, or want to receive your message, let's get to know them as a human being. Mm. Get to know them as a human being and you develop a relationship. And women are good at developing and relationships. We're, we're great at it. <laughs> exactly, that's one of our strengths. And so by using that strength, you can develop a relationship with an individual person and then you create allies. And if you've got a group of people that you have to influence that have nothing that have no knowledge of you whatsoever. It's going to be incredibly hard because they're going to look at you and they're just going to look at, they're going to have all these biases about your age, your gender, your this, your this, your this. But if you have had a coffee with every person in that room and had a chat with them and know about their families and they know about your family and they know about your experience or, or your, just, your desire to be learning and to be doing stuff, they're going to become your ally. They're going to stick up for you. And even if you're not in the room, And somebody says, oh, no, don't get her because, you know, she's too young or mm -hmm. whatever. You'll have someone in the room who will stick up for you. So it's about creating allies and using our own strengths to find out how we can be most useful. Thank you so much. No worries. <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> and you. that was Yasmin on Yana TV. As you can see, she's an absolutely fascinating, inspirational woman. So for all girls who are watching it right now, go for your dreams, step up. Don't be afraid. And for all gentlemen, please encourage women around you. We do need this extra care and nurturing. And if you love this video, what we hope you do, share it with friends, join our community, and I'm going to talk to you next week. I want, I mean, one of my reasons why I'm getting a book out is, you know, for people to be able to not have to go through the journey that I had, um, you know, if, if I could help somebody to accelerate the process of influence really fast and make a difference, then that would really be something that I, I, I would dream of.